Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We give you all the glory. Come on, right there in your homes, let's begin to worship the Lord. What a joy, what a privilege it is to come to you like this. Come on, Deshni, read us Psalms 92. It says, it is good to praise you, Lord, and make music to your name, O Most High. It is good to praise you, Lord, and make music to your name, O Most High, O Most High. It is good to praise you, Lord, and make music to your name, O Most High. It is good to praise you, Lord, and make music to your name, O Most High. To proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Amen. Amen. Oh, what a joy and a privilege to come into your beautiful homes, wherever you at, wherever you're watching. We want to welcome you to this Sunday morning celebration service where there is hope, where Jesus loves you and Jesus is the answer for your situation. We're glad that you're honoring this time to worship and praise the Lord. Give Him all the honor to our Good News Center family. We want to welcome you locally, internationally. What a blessing it is to give Him all the praise. We want to also urge you right now, if you have a prayer request, please send in your prayer request right at the beginning of this celebration service. Amen. If you're watching on Facebook, on Twitter, on uh, YouTube, however, come on, begin to like the channel, share the page, create a watch party, be faithful. Amen. An online evangelist because you are God's chosen vessel and we so blessed to all the dads out there, the moms, the single moms, single dads, whatever your situation is, Jesus knows it like nobody else and we encourage you to come into the presence of the Lord. We are delighted to worship with you today because in the presence of Jehovah, oh, there is peace. He answers, He gives you all that you need today. Come on, let's sing that in the presence of the King. Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, Lord, in the presence. Hallelujah. Pastor 
Jesus, if he's so, won't you come and pray right now as we continue right in the presence of the Lord, believing God for an awesome time in his presence today. Pastor Sabiso, hallelujah. Oh, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Good morning. Thank you for joining us once again. It's a wonderful morning. Amen. I hope that you have been taking care of yourselves at home. You've been praying. You've been watching. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for liking the page. I'm here just to pray. Amen. I believe that God has something special in these last days. These are the days of preparations. And I'm going to read something from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 22 from verse number 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room? Where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished, prepared it there. Verse number 13, and they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Verse number 14, and when the hour came, he reclined at, at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Amen. This is the time, the most exciting time where you are preparing yourself because one day we are going to dine with the master. Amen. I believe that we are here just for a temporary time and I believe that we are going to dine once again with the master. So the master summons the disciples to go and prepare a place. So this morning, are you preparing yourself? Are you preparing your heart? Because this is a most crucial time where we are going to sit down and dine with the master. Amen. So I want us to pray for just a few specific prayer points. Uh, one that has been very deep in my heart. Bring back the power of the cross. Which is found from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse number 18. Bring back sincere worship, which is found from John chapter 4, verse 23 to verse 24. God will find the worshipers. Worship will be in the spirit. Worship will be in truth. Amen. Bring back the power of the word of God, which is taken from Matthew chapter 4 from verse number 4. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from his mouth. Hallelujah. And finally, can we please pray for the body of Christ? Even as you are joining at home, let us begin to pray in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you all the praise. We thank you for the power of the cross because it is where everything was taking place. You took our infirmities upon you. You took our shame upon you. You died for us in the name of Jesus. And this morning, Father, we acknowledge the power of the cross and we are coming back to the simple things where the message of the cross has been taken granted. But Father, we repent and say, we are coming back in the name of Jesus because we know the cross reconciled us with the Father. And we pray this morning even for coming back 
to the truth, the word of the living God. Your word declares that a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed from the mouth of God. We thank you that we are growing in your knowledge. We thank you, Father, that even as we come to you to worship, we're going to have the heart of sincere worship because your word declares that you are seeking for those who are worshiping you in truth and in the spirit. And Father, we rejoice this morning. We thank you. We thank you even as your servant is going to come and deliver your word. We thank you for your word even as we come and dine in your table. In the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you even for the children's ministry. We thank you for the Jesus Troopers. We thank you for the children's ministry all over the world. Your word declares that train up a child in the ways of the Lord. And then when he is old, they will not depart. We thank you. We give you all the praise in the name of Jesus. We thank you even for those who are watching over the internet. We thank you, Father, for those who are joining us on Facebook. Those who are watching on YouTube. In the name that is above every other name, we pray that today their needs will be met in the power of your mighty name, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, even as we are about to enjoy and cherish the children's ministry. In the name of Jesus, amen. In Psalm 107, the writer says that everyone who has received help from God should give praise and thanks to the Lord. From the east to the west and from the north to the south, everyone who has been redeemed and saved from trouble should tell their stories of deliverance and victory. Some who wandered in the desert wastelands became unable to find a city where they could live. Out of food and water, they were near death when they called out to the Lord, Help us! God led these nomads straight to a city where they could find food, water, and a place to stay. Let's give thanks for God's unfailing love that satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry. Some once sat in darkness, cowering in the shadow of death. They were prisoners chained to their decision to rebel against God's word. Weighed down from the pain and suffering brought on by their poor choices, they cried out, Help us, Lord! Rescue us! God's light broke through the darkness, and he broke their chains and led them into freedom. Let's give thanks to the merciful God who breaks every chain and sets us free. Some foolish individuals allowed their sin to carry them into sorrow and suffering. Despite growing sick and feeble, they refused to eat any food. At the very gates of death, they cried out to the Lord, Help us! God healed them and saved them from the situation they had inflicted upon themselves. Let's give thanks to the God who heals us because of his wonderful love and kindness. Some set sail upon the sea for faraway lands. These people witnessed God's mighty power during their time at sea. Terrible storms battered their ships, sending them up and down massive waves and causing them to stumble and stagger. Unable to even stand up and fearing that they may sink, they cried out, Rescue us, Lord! God calmed the storm and brought them safely to their destination. Let's give thanks to the God of power who is great and wonderful to those he loves. God's power is unmatched. If he chooses, he can dry up a river and turn the land into desert. He can take a fruitful land and turn it into a swamp because of the wickedness of those living there. He can turn a barren wilderness into a life-giving oasis, allowing cities to spring up, 
where God's people are blessed and prosper greatly. In the cities God has blessed, some prosperous people turn from God and hurt people, even those who are less fortunate. God rejects the proud and arrogant and lifts up the humble and needy. He raises up the lowly and gives them a safe place to live where their enemies cannot touch them. Let's give thanks to God for His love and mercy that will never end or diminish. Would you like to participate in giving with Good News Center? Then make sure to go to goodnewscenter.org slash give. Add your amount that fits for you. You can choose to give to Good News Center, Bottle Brush Community Outreach, 
or to the COVID-19 relief fund. Donating is simple. You can use PayPal or fill in your own credit card details. Also, you can use the option to give on a monthly basis. Hallelujah! Oh, it is good to praise the Lord. The book of Psalms 92 says, Oh, it is good to give Him all the praise, oh, Most High. Come on, let's stand together right in your homes. Get everybody together and let's praise the Lord. Come on. Woo!
oh God, oh we honor you Lord, we bless your holy name, oh most high. Hallelujah, oh we bless his holy name, come on as we continue to worship and praise our God, hallelujah, thank you Jesus. Hallelujah. It is good to praise the Lord. He is home most high. And we honor you, Lord. Amen. How many of you can say that God is faithful to you and I? Amen. In this last year, 2020, 2021. Oh, my God. You've been so, so faithful to us. And we worship you. Join me as we sing faithful. Thank you, Lord. When I felt like the burden was more than I could hold. Yeah. When the whispers of worry overwhelm my soul. Yeah. You never left me alone. You were there all along. 
heart be afraid. He's never gonna change. your presence you. just the mention of that name you. Jesus every sickness will flee yes. every oppression will go oh, yes. healing will flow in the mighty name of Jesus come on right there hallelujah that's right that's right as tears are rolling down your eyes as you're worshiping as you're lifting up the name of Jesus we tremble at your name, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it rain. Your name, still call the seas to sail, the rage in me to sail, every way at your name. Silence, breathing. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, breathe. All these bones to live, all these guns to sing once again. Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord. We give you the glory. Demons tremble at your name, the name that is above every other name. We bless you, we praise you, we magnify you. We give you all the glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And even as you get ready in your home right now to take communion with us, Open your hearts, prepare yourself. This is the place of victory. This is where you can see and experience the miracle working power of God. The blood of Jesus brings victory. The blood of Jesus brings salvation. It was at the cross of Jesus Christ. The price was paid. Hallelujah. So if you have your communion, let's get ready together. Remember the Bible tells us the Lord Jesus... On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread after giving thanks. And he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. And as often as you eat of this, he said, you do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat of the bread, celebrating what Jesus did with his body. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The Bible says he was bruised for our iniquities. His body was bruised for our iniquities. And as we eat, we receive what he did. And after the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of this, you do this in remembrance of me. Let's drink of the cup celebrating what is given to us as a new covenant in his blood. The blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For he says, as often as we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come and join me as we begin to thank him. Thank you for what he has done. Thank you for the breakthrough. Thank you for the healing. Thank you for the, for the, for the forgiveness of your sin. The most important thing for your salvation. Hallelujah. We bless you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor because you deserve all praise. You deserve all honor. We bless you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Amen. And if you just joined us as well, we welcome you. We thank God for what He has done. Thank you, worship team, for being able to share with us and minister and join and, and, and allow us to get into the presence of God. And even now as we get ready, we know that God is going to do some amazing things. So I want to remind you to like the page, share the page, invite a friend, invite somebody to watch with you at this time. If, you, if you're on YouTube, subscribe to the channel. We'd love to hear from you as to what God is doing. Send us your prayer requests. We're going to be praying at the end of the service. So you got these moments to send us a text on the number that is on your screen, or you can send us an email to prayer at goodnewscenter.org. And remember, if you'd like for it to be private, we will keep it private. But send it. We'll pray today, and we'll be praying every day for you. Amen. What an exciting time that we're living in. And guess what? We're so excited today because we have Pastor Cecil with us to preach the Word of God. And truly, yes, we have missed him. I'm so glad that we have this opportunity that he can come back and share with us. So join us at this time, Pastor Cecil. I know that you have something wonderful. I know that you have something amazing to share with us. So get ready, family. Get ready for this moment because God has something special to say to us. Amen. God bless you and enjoy what the Word of God says today. Pastor Cecil. Good morning, family of Good News Center. I greet you all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, it gives me great pleasure even to address you this morning. I want to give thanks to our senior pastor, Dennis John, for allowing me the privilege and the honor even to share the Word of God. And before I even start, I just want to express on behalf of myself and my family our gratitude to the church, even in praying and for the messages of support, even through this difficult beginning to the year that we had. But we praise and give God glory and thanks for his strength and for his comfort to us. So even this morning, I don't want to spend much time because I want to get straight into the word and this morning, I'm speaking to the church. This morning, I want us to challenge the status quo of the purpose of the church. Now, sometimes we've been growing up in the church, and we hear a lot of scriptures, we hear a lot of uh, word of God, and these scriptures become as if it's cliched or it comes like a byword to us. We don't really understand. We don't really give thought or meditate on the word to understand its meaning. So this morning, even as pastor said the theme for the year, in putting God first. Now even that uh, phrase, sometimes if we say it, Often enough, it becomes a cliche. But this morning, I want us to just pause and let's analyze and unpack what it is when we say we put God first. Now, one thing about me and when it comes to singing songs in the church, I'm very particular of the songs that we sing and I, and I don't sing the song for the sake of singing it or for its catchy beat. It needs to to, to have some uh, meaning, and also it needs to reflect the glory of God. Now, I'm here in no means to, to, to uh, knock any songs that we've been singing or knock any songs that we, because I understand where the songwriter is coming from. But sometimes we say and do things in the body of Christ and we accept it to be the truth when really we need to take cognizance of whatever we hear, we need to filter it through the Word of God to understand the real meaning and truth of the Word of God. So the song I'm going to, I'm going to draw your attention to, it's a popular song, it's a catchy song, it's a lovely song, we sing it in, I think we sing it in church as well. And the songwriter is saying, well I... I will sing it to you all, but apparently I've got too lovely a voice, so I'll just say the words. And I'm taking an extract from the song, and the songwriter is saying, do what you are famous for. 
make way through the waters, walk me through the fire, do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. Shut the mouths of lions, bring dry bones to life, and do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. Now, when I heard the song, hey, I, I also caught up in a beat, and, but then the scripture came to mind, and I want us to go back to the scripture, and let's analyze and unpack what we are singing. Now, do what you're famous for, it took me to when Jesus addressed his disciples. The Bible says that he sat them down and he asked, who do men say I am? To, to draw the parallel to the song, he asked his disciples, hey, what am I famous for? And the answers that he got, oh, you're John the Baptist, you are uh, Elijah, he got all different answers. This morning, if we ask the church, what is God famous for? Or what is Jesus famous for? And sometimes we might get, he's a healer, he's the prince of peace, he's, he's everything. But then Peter gave this declaration. You can read about it in Matthew chapter 16. Peter gave this declaration and he said, you are the son of God. And then Jesus was amazed at the answer that Peter gave. And he said, Peter, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but this has been revealed by my Father himself. The Spirit of God has revealed this to you. And he said, he went on to say, and on this confession, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prosper against it or will not prevail against it. So, when we try to analyze the scripture, and we try to analyze where we are in the church, and if we had to ask the church, what is Jesus famous for? And I'm guaranteed that we'll get the answers of healer, deliverer, way maker, promise keeper. Yes, he is all of these things. I in no means want to discredit all that we've been taught. Even as pastor a few weeks back, he spoke about I don't want to throw the baby out with the bath water, but this morning I'm here to challenge us to change the bath water, but keep the baby. In other words, there are things that we've learned and we've taught, we don't throw it all out, but this morning I want to break away all of the glitz and the glamour of what church has become, and I want to take us now to bare bones, to why is the church relevant in today's uh, world. What is the purpose of the church? To, uh, to, to get an understanding of the purpose of the church, we got to dig a little deeper from just the confession that Peter made, that Jesus, you are the Son of God. Peter looked beyond all the other things that people were saying about Jesus. And he cut to the very heart of God. He, he, he revealed that Jesus, you are the son of God. So this morning, I want to just throw some scriptures that y'all all, oh, if I, I, I had this picture in my mind where, I'm not sure when you were growing up, or maybe we, we, we buy these books for our children, where you've got dots on a page, and if you connect the dots, a picture becomes clearer. So even this morning, I want to connect some dots within the scripture of God to make something clear, to make some picture, uh, to create a big picture that we can have an a, 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 a idea of what the purpose of the church is. So let's dig a little deeper. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses. The word witnesses is a legal term. To, to be a witness, you have got to have knowledge of some event. It's a legal term. They use it in the court of law. So you have to 
If you're a witness, you have to have first hand knowledge of what you are testifying about. And generally, if you're a witness, you are a witness to an event that occurred. You are a witness to maybe an accident. You are a witness to, to the character of somebody. It means that you stand and you are giving testimony on some event or some case that is brought against somebody. I want you to bear with me because I'm going to be a bit drawn out, but I want to get somewhere. So this morning, even as we, 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 we unpack this, remember that you are called to be a witness against in a case. In a court of law, you are called to be a witness because there is some case that is being judged or being tried. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10, talking about the purpose of the church. Paul is writing the scripture and he said, a mystery has been made known to me. And he said, God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. The manifold wisdom of God, meaning the, the, the uh, multifaceted, the, the amazing, wonderful wisdom of God to be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. So you ask yourself, who are these rulers and these authorities in the heavenly realms? So now let's go a little deeper. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, and I just want to read the scripture quickly for you. The Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Next scripture. For the, Amen. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, opened not the house of these prisoners? All the kings of the nations, all of them lie in glory, every one in his own house. Amen. We'll just leave it here. But... The, I don't know what version this is, but anyway. Basically, this portion of scripture is drawing our attention to the fall of Satan. Now, I'm going to paraphrase the scripture just to get, for us to get an understanding. I said we are called to be witnesses because there is a case that needs to be heard. God is presenting a case to who? That through the church... He might make known to the principalities and powers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. So when Satan, who was in the, one of the archangels or favored angels of God, when he became proud in his heart and he lifted up his heart and then he said he will be like the most high. The very thought, the very uh, intent of his heart angered God because God cast him out of heaven. But we got to understand that when the, Satan said he will be like the most, uh, he will be like God, he brought some things into question. Firstly, he brought the sovereignty of God. Secondly, he brought the authority of God into question. 
So when I said the case that needs to be heard, I want us to understand that this is the case that needs to be heard in the sense that God's sovereignty and God's authority. Now the Bible goes on to say that a third of the angels fell with Satan. So God, not that God had anything to prove, but his ways and thoughts are above our thoughts. In God, in all of his wisdom, he needed to, not that he needed to, he wanted to prove his sovereignty and his ultimate authority. So imagine this now, if we are in, 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 an, uh, in, a, in a congregation and somebody rises up to question my authority as the leader of the organization, I can do one of three things. I can become dictatorial and just say, this is my way or no other way. But you see, the wisdom of God is so amazing. God, he said, okay, Satan, out of here because there can't be anybody like you. But the, in the, the kingdom, the heavenly realm was split into two. We had the kingdom of light and we had the kingdom of darkness. And so God, in Ephesians chapter 3, he is pointing us to this, that he is making his wisdom known to the kingdom of darkness and to the kingdom of light through the church. So we get the understanding of why the church is here on the earth. We are, our ultimate plan and purpose is to be a witness because the case has been brought against God, a case against his authority, a case against his sovereignty. So we, as a church, we ought to step out as witnesses. So what are we a witness for? We are a witness to God's sovereignty and we are a witness to God's authority. So it's not just simple as Jesus, our healer, Jesus, our deliverer, but now we are talking about the sovereign God, the only God, the true God. So anyway, God, in his wisdom, decided that he would prove his case. So he created man. In Genesis chapter 1, we hear about Adam and the old creation story. And in verse, uh, chapter 2, the Bible says that God made man in his own image. So he formed man out of the dust, and then he breathed into man. And man became a living being. Now you must understand that when God breathed into Adam, it's the breath of life, but beyond the breath of life, it is death. Now, don't, don't fade on me now. Don't, don't let me lose you now. I want us to understand that the breath of God, it brought life to Adam, but the breath of God brought death to his flesh. It brought death to his carnality. So in the breathing of God into the nostrils, we say Adam became a living being. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says that when Adam sinned, when God said, if you sin, you will surely die. So when Adam sinned, he died. But we know that Adam lived to be, to beget uh, Cain and Abel, and, and he lived beyond the time that he sinned. So at that point of the breath of God, there is a they, we need to understand that the breath of God brings life and it brings death. Life to our spirit being, but death to the flesh, death to carnality. So even as we, we draw a parallel now, in 1 Peter, so, so when God created Adam, he gave him full power, full authority here on the earth. Meaning that just like our God was in heaven, Adam was here on the earth. The Bible says, or the Bible says, I am saying, 
the accusation was, how can you be the only God? How can you have all power and all authority just by yourself? Because that is what Satan, that was what Satan's accusation against God was. And so God, in answering that question, in, 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 in answering that accusation, he created another one just like him. That is why Adam is created in the image of God. Everything God was, Adam was here on the earth. The same power, the same authority he had on the earth. So there was not, nothing that Adam lacked here on the earth. So God told him, if you eat of the fruit of the tree, you will surely die. There was just one commandment that Adam had to obey. But we see how Satan came and how he deceived Adam. So at the point that Adam ate that fruit, we see God proved his case. Because it is only God that can be sovereign, that can be the only God. There is no other God except the one and true living God. There is only God that can be entrusted with such power and such authority. Because even as we, uh, I'm not sure if you all did the book in school, Animal Farm, they said, with much power comes much responsibility. So Adam, who had all of this power and all of this authority, and he was, there was nobody like Adam, Adam was exactly like God, but yet, he lacked. How can a God lack? If you're a God, you must be complete. There must be no lack in you. So when Adam saw the fruit and he desired it and he looked to make him wise and to make him like God, so Adam wasn't complete. Adam was, uh, wasn't God because he had lack in him. So God is saying, there can't be anybody like me. I am the only true God. I am the sovereign God. And nobody, nobody can be entrusted with such power and such authority. So God answers his critics. I know I'm making this into a little, uh, uh, cliche, uh, not cliche, a little easy to, to, to understand. I'm not trying to dumb it down, but I want us to understand the bare, bare knuckles of what we are as a church. We exist for no other reason but to declare to the powers in the heavenly realms that God is the only true God. Which we exist to declare that God is the sovereign God and he has all authority. But unfortunately, Adam failed. He failed in his power and authority, but he in a way, proved what God declaring to the heavenly realms, that he was the only true God. So this seems a bit uh, unfair, if I might say. It seems a bit selfish on God's behalf. How could you set up somebody for failure? How can you set somebody up knowing that they are going to fall? But once again, the wisdom of God is beyond what we can understand. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1.20, it talks about the Lamb of God that was prepared before the foundations of the world. So don't think when Adam sinned, he caught God by surprise. God knew because God is God. He is all-knowing. He is omniscient. He knows there can't be anybody like him. He knows that nobody can wield such authority that he does. So, in, 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 in creating Adam, he knew Adam was going to fall or fail, but also God had a plan already. So, Jesus wasn't a plan that was made when Adam sinned. The Bible says the Lamb of God that was slain, even from creation, from before the foundation of this world. So, we understand that God had a plan for man. God had a plan for uh, uh, Adam's failure. He already knew what he was going to do. And the Bible, uh, 
goes on further and talks about Jesus coming and giving his life and reconciling us to God. The Bible says in Revelation 12 verse 10, And they shall overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. He talks about this, the devil being an accuser. He accused God and now daily is accusing you and I. But the Bible says, we shall overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So if you are a witness, you have to give a testimony. So as a witness, what is your testimony about Jesus? What is your testimony about God? Is your testimony that God healed me? Is your testimony that, that uh, God broke, uh, uh, God repaired your broken relationship? Is your testimony, what is your testimony? Now, I don't want to discredit these testimonies, but the testimony of the church should be that you are the sovereign God. We cannot do this on our own. We cannot please you. We cannot do anything on our own. We need you. We are dependent on you. That should be a word of your testimony because without God, we are nothing. The Bible says, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For anybody who comes to God must first believe that he is. So what must we believe that God is? Firstly, we need to believe that God is God. We need to believe that there is nobody like him. Now, when God created man, he gave him authority here on the earth. So, when Jesus came, the Bible talks about Jesus leaving his throne, his heavenly realm, to come into our earthly realm. And then he went to the cross and he died. And now he is seated with, with our Father in heaven. So, even as we come to understand the blood of the Lamb, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, we see that there was an exchange. He gave his physical body. He gave up his life so that we could be reconciled to Abba Father. So that is the blood of the Lamb. The word of our chest is when we receive Jesus, the Bible says that Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. And when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us, it gives us the power to become witnesses. So when we receive Jesus, we receive the power to become witnesses and to testify of God's power and God's sovereignty and God's authority. So that should be our main purpose in life, is to declare the sovereignty of God and the authority of God in that no matter what happens around us, you are still God. It may be chaos all around us, but you are still God. Everything around me may be crumbling, but you are still God. Everything around us may be falling apart, but you are still God. That is what it means to, to surrender to God. It means that no matter what we're going through, we need to come to the place where we are at peace with God. Now, uh, Paul had an idea of what it is to be, to surrender to God. The Bible says that uh, in Philippians 4 verse 11 and 12, it says, I've learned to be content in every situation. In Galatians 2 verse 20, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but it is Christ that lives within us, within me. Even as we uh, begin to understand what Paul is saying, when we receive Jesus into our lives, we surrender our authority over to God. Now to understand the wisdom of God, 
God, because of his character and because of who he is, he understands authority and he understands uh, sovereignty. On Tuesday, Pastor uh, spoke about the centurion that went to Jesus and he said, Jesus, speak a word from here. You don't have to come to my house. I know my servant will be healed. And Jesus was marveled and he was astonished because never has he heard such faith. The faith wasn't in anything else, but the faith was in you are God and you have all authority. And that is what God wants from us. That is what God is looking for a church where we will surrender everything to him. Everything we're not going to understand. We're not going to know all things. But because he is God, we surrender to him and we know that all things will work for good to those that love God and are called according to his purposes. But even if it doesn't work out to how good, you are still God. I totally committed to you. It is not about the glitz and the glamour. It's not about the promise keeping. It's not about the way making. It's not about anything else. It's only about you being God, being the sovereign God, the one from whom flows all authority, the one from whom flows all power. And that is why we are here on the earth at the church. It's to make known or it's to be a witness to the heavenly realms that the accusation you are brought against God has no merit. Because without God, we can do nothing. He gave us the opportunity to be, like, to be like Him, a God like Him, but we failed. So there can't be any other gods. He is the only true God. He is the only one that, is, that we can trust to have authority and the one that we can trust to be consistent. Because Paul was able to say, in every situation, I've learned to be content because he understood that if you are God, you have to be consistent. He said, I've learned to be poor. I was poor and I was rich, but in every situation, God has been my provider. God has been the one that was in control. So even, you may think, what am I rambling on about in uh, about God's sovereignty and God's authority. It's because in my observation about uh, even through this pandemic, I look very closely at the church and what is the church saying? What is the church doing? And I find that the church actually don't know what we are doing. We don't know where we're going because we don't understand what it is to be content in any situation. Our contentment doesn't come from anything else. Our, no, our contentment comes from being children of God. Our contentment ought to come because he has all power and he has all authority. Our contentment comes because, Lord, I give you full control. You are in control, so I'm at peace because I don't have to worry. If you want to heal, you heal. You don't want to heal, you are God. And that is where we need to come. We sing songs about, uh, I know you'll do it again. If you did it for him, you'll do it for her. If you did it now, you'll do it then. God can do anything he pleases. We need to come to the point where we allow God to be God. Too, for too long, we want God to be who we want him to be. God says in himself, I will have mercy on whoever I have mercy. So we need to, to, to cut through all the, 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 the nonsense that we, that, um, not so much the nonsense, to some of the stuff that we are hearing. We need to get a clear understanding that our contentment and our peace must come because he is God. Now I said when God breathed into Adam, it was both life and death. It was life to his spirit man and he was death to his flesh. So when we understand who Jesus is, the Bible said Jesus is the word of God. Because in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was 
God. So the word of God is Jesus and Jesus is God. We know that. We, I don't want to get into any uh, details of that, but we understand. The Bible says the word became flesh and dwelt amongst men. So we see the word of God is fundamental to the believer because God is his word. And if as a believer we don't spend time with the word of God, how are we going to be have a faith in God that we know nothing about? Because everything that we know about God is going to reveal through his word. In, in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now we say the scripture and we quote it, oh, always put God first, seek ye first. But we don't understand what it is to put God, to seek first the kingdom of God. To seek first, for us, seeking the kingdom of God is seeking the benefits of being in the kingdom of God. That is not what the scripture says. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. What a the writer is saying in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he's saying that we need to seek the sovereignty and the authority of God in our lives. We need to give God full control of our life. We can't have, okay, God, today uh, you are in charge, but then uh, in other things I'm in charge. No. If we want to seek first the kingdom of God, it's a total surrender of your life to God. And the only way that we can surrender our lives fully to God is if we surrender our lives to his word. Now, coming back to when God created Adam, the Bible says God breathed into Adam and that was both life and death. And what do we know about scripture? In Timothy, the Bible talks about all scripture is God breathed. So when we hear the word of God and we understand the word of God and we meditate on the word of God, it is God's breath over our lives. And the breath of God, as I said, it brings life and death in a sense that we become spiritually alive, but our carnal nature is death. So God wants to breathe upon us like he breathed over Adam and he breathed life into Adam but death to his carnality. In the same way, when God breathes upon us through his word, it must bring life to our spirit man and death to the flesh. So every time the flesh wants to rise up, we got to allow the word of God to bring death. We got to allow God to bring life to our spirit man so that we can please God. Now, you will wonder how does this old thing plays out in life? What, 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 what am I on about? I want to draw your attention to the boys in the book of Daniel that were thrown into the fire. All they knew was the word of God. You shall have no other gods but the living God. So when King Nebuchadnezzar said they must bow down and worship, they knew the word of God. That is all they knew. They knew that we will not bow down and worship anybody, but we'll only bow down to the true and living God. So even as the threats were made against them, and I like what they said. Due to time, you can read it in Daniel chapter 3. The Bible talks about, they made a declaration. They said, our God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we are not going to bow down. Now sometimes in our lives, the word of God may, may not make sense to your situation. The word of God may ask and declare that you act and speak in a certain way. You don't go and do things your own way. If you say you are dead to yourself, if you say that it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me, then how is Christ living in you if 
you are doing everything contrary to the word of God. So when the word of God says, love your enemies, hey, even if it kills you, love your enemies. The Bible says, forgive one another. Hey, even if it kills you, forgive one another. Because that is what the Hebrew boys were saying. I have no meaning for my life. God's word is the, is the authoritative word in my life. God, you are all powerful in my life. No, even if, I'm, if I die in this fire, even if I die in this situation, Lord, but whatever your word says, I'm going to stick on it and I'm going to hold on to it because I know that you are God. You are in control. And so the Bible talks about them being thrown into the fire. And then, as the, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar looked, he saw suddenly there were four. And the fourth man looked like the, the son of God. In Galatians 4 verse 10, 4 verse 19, Paul is saying, I'm like, a, I'm like in labor pains again, I'm paraphrasing. I'm like in labor pains for you that Christ will be formed in you. So we need the word of God in us so that Christ can be formed in us. Just like the Hebrew boys, they knew the commandment, you shall worship or bow down to no other gods but me. They stood on that word. They received that word. They believed that word. And no matter what the threats were around them, they said, Lord, I stand on your word. Even if it kills us, I'm going to stand on your word. And we see that when they were thrown into the fire, a fourth person was revealed. So Christ needs to be formed in us so that when we are in the fire, he can be revealed through us. Just like making known his manifold wisdom to the principalities in the heavenly realms, when we are faced with situations that are beyond our control, what is the world seeing? What is the heavenly realm seeing? Is, are they seeing the church that, oh, the fire is too hot? Are they seeing that, oh, we don't know what to do? We, are, are they seeing the church all in a tiz because a hey, COVID is taking over and it's very popular to preach, oh, the kingdom of God is at hand. We are living in the end times. Church, relax. Paul said this, I don't know, in, in well, maybe thousands of years ago, that the kingdom of God is at hand. So we know God is coming. We know the kingdom of God is coming. So why suddenly now pull out all, as soon as there's a global pandemic i'm not sure what the church did with the spanish flu i don't know what the church did during the world wars what was their voice but i'm living through this pandemic and all i'm hearing is we are living in the end times so what if you are living in the end times? what changed from pre-pandemic to current pandemic or post-pandemic what has changed for the believer it should be nothing as a believer we should know and be as paul said in whatever situation we are content, it's not a, 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 a we accept everything that is happening to us, but our contentment comes because God, you are in control. You are God. So it's time that we in the church, if we preach in God, then let God be God. We need to preach that he, he is the only God. He is the sovereign God and there is nobody like him. If you want to experience him, you got to totally surrender your life to him. There's no part surrender. It is a total surrender. You give your life. We come to the cross. A lot of us come to the cross because of what Jesus did. Yes, we come to the cross because of what Jesus did. But that's not where it ends. We need to come to the cross to go beyond the cross in the sense that when we come to the cross, not because Jesus died for us, we come to the cross because we want to die to live for God. 
We want to die. We want to be on the cross. That's why Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. I identify in his sufferings because for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So I came to the cross because God recognized that I'm a sinner. So sinners come to the cross, but the believers give up their life. In a sense that we surrender all authority to God. God has given us control on the earth. We have every right to be called gods because we are created in the image of God. But we recognize how limited we are or how foolish we are when we think we are God. The Bible says, let this mind be your Jew, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, he didn't think it robbery. So it wasn't, if Jesus said he was God, it wasn't like, hey, he's blaspheme or anything. He was God. But the Bible said he made himself of no reputation. So we need the church to stop putting up the bright light and the big sign and declaring this is the church. We need to come down low. We need to come down to a place of humility and declare that God, we are totally surrendered to you. It is you and you only. And thank God that we declare even in this house, it should be everywhere, that it's all about Jesus. There is no glory in what we do. There is no glitz and glamour in what we do. It's all for God's glory, for his honor, and for his majesty. And if for nothing else, we want to declare that there is no other God but the true and living God. He is the one that has all power. He is the one that has authority. And that is what it means to be a sacrifice to God. Because we got every right to say we are in control. But when you give up your authority, that's when God is able to work in our realm. Because God understands authority and because when his authority was questioned, it angered him. In the same way, God wouldn't impose on the authority that we have on the earth. But the thing with authority is the authority is delegated. So when we surrender our authority and say, Lord, we are foolish to think that we can do it on our own, that is when we give up our life. And that is when God steps in and he breathes on us, meaning he breathes his life into us. And so we are able to become true witnesses of God's glory and majesty. So we are not here on the earth for any other reason except to be a true witness. And you shall overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. What is your testimony today? Is your testimony still that God healed me, I was dying of cancer? Yes, we praise God for that. But our testimony should be that he is God. Yes, he healed me, but I recognize now that I'm a child of God. I understand who he is. I understand that he's not just a healer. He's not just a way maker. He's not just a promise keeper. I understand that he is God. He can do whatever he wants. So even as the Bible says, I'm going to end with this because I can uh, carry on on this point. But when you look at the life of Job, Job argued with God, okay, and you can understand where Job was coming from, because Job was a righteous man. He did everything according to what God, if you, if you had to uh, analyze Job, there was nothing that he did to deserve the suffering that he went through. But then God posed this to, to Job, finally, when God answered, he said, where were you when I set the boundaries for the earth? Where were you when I set the foundations of the earth? How is it that you are able to question me? And so even at this point, God is speaking to the church. Don't question me. Don't try to figure me out. Isaiah 55 verse 19, he says, God's ways, uh, 55 verse 19, he says, my ways are far above your ways. My thoughts are far above your thoughts. So even this morning, church, I want to encourage you. We need to come to the point where we are totally surrendered to God. And when I say totally surrendered, I mean that we give him full authority and full reign. And so even as the Bible talks about the potter and the clay, we need to come to that place where we are just clay. And God is the potter. He's going to break us. He's going to mold us. He's going to shape us. He's going to do things to us, some that are good, some that are going to hurt. But he is God. I pray that we'll come to the point where God, 
I don't want anything from you. I just want to worship you for who you are. You are God alone. There is nothing that we need from mortal man. We sing that song. I love that song. I think that song captures what we need to know about God. That Whether it's good times or bad times, whether it's pandemic or not pandemic, he is still God. And when we come and when we get to an understanding, that is why God says, on that confession, so I bring you back to the confession that Peter made. On that confession that you are God, I am building my church. So forget about all that happens. Yes, we praise God for the healings, for his deliverance, and for all of his benefits. But let's cut it through the chase and get through the bare knuckles. He is God. He does what he pleases. And when we begin to understand, nothing will shake us, nothing will move us, because we understand that although we may be in charge on the earth, it is God that is in control on the earth. The Bible talks about Jesus being the lion of the tribe of Judah. The, uh, oh well, I heard something the other day which kind of like sums up what I'm going to say. When Christ is formed in you, when the Hebrew boys were thrown into the fire, it said that the fire in them burned brighter than the fire that was around them. So when Christ is formed in you, no matter what is happening around you, the Christ in you, his glory will shine brighter than your circumstance, than your situation. Daniel thrown into the lion's den. But when the lion in you roars, he silenced the roar of every other lion that's around you. That is what Christ in you, that is your hope of glory. There is no other glory except the glory that Christ in you. So Christ needs to be formed in us. Christ needs to be revealed in us. Christ can be formed in us so that he can be revealed to the principality, to the powers, to the kingdom of doctors that, hey, he is the only true God. No matter what you're declared, no matter what you're accused, but he is the true and living God. And we are testimony to that fact. So the church exists. Finally, I'm saying it again, and finally this time. The church exists for no other reason but to declare the glory and the sovereignty and the authority of God. He is God alone. Amen. Shall we pray? Our dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning that you could share your word with us, O oh God. Father, we thank you that even as your word declares that the Spirit shall reveal all truth to us, Holy Spirit, I ask that even as I've spoken the word that you have given me, Lord, I pray that you'll open the eyes of our understanding, O oh God, that we might acknowledge and know that you are God and you are God alone, the only true living God, the sovereign God, the mighty God, the awesome God, how great you are, O oh Lord. Father, we cannot even begin to fathom, we cannot begin to understand the expanse of your wisdom, O oh God. But Lord, you are the one that reveals your wisdom through the church, O oh God. And so as a church, we come before you, O oh God. We totally surrender. Lord, our will, our way, our, our authority, our emotions, everything, we give it all to you, O oh God. And say, Lord, here we are to worship, here we are to magnify, here we are to glorify your name. Lord, you are the potter, we are the clay. Won't you break us? Won't you mold us? Won't you shape us, oh God, into what you want for us to be, oh God? And so we surrender to you through good times and through bad. You are still on your throne, for you are God alone. Thank you once again for this morning. Thank you for your sons and daughters that have uh, been under the hearing of this word. Lord, I pray every confusion will be wiped out, oh God, as Holy Spirit that you will grant revelational knowledge in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise and I give you thanks in no other name but the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Sister. That was an awesome, challenging, powerful word. And as you were speaking before you came to talk about the Hebrew boys, this scripture came to my mind from Daniel. Those who know their God, that we know him as healer, we know him as deliverer, as savior, but do you know him as the sovereign God? 
you know him as the one who has all authority. That's the thing that will be declared. And I think I can put it this way. We get emotionally caught up in our expressions and don't really understand the intelligence of what we are supposed to say. What we're supposed to declare. He is God. In spite of. No matter what. No matter what's going on. No matter what's taking place. Church exists to declare the sovereignty and the authority of God. To make it known to the principalities and powers. Amen. Thank you for blessing us. We receive that today in Jesus' name. I'm sure you'll be blessed. And we know that God is, listen, God is completely aware of everything that is going on. He is even aware of what you are going through right now. Some of us think God does not know what's happening in my life. So I need to tell him. So let me shout a little bit louder. Whether you shout loud or you speak with a small, still voice, God knows all things. There is nothing that the Lord doesn't, let me put it this way. It's impossible for the Lord not to know everything. He knows everything. And he understands your situation. And saying that, I want to let you know, we're going to be praying in a few minutes. For those of you who have a special need, if you, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube or whether you're on Periscope or whether you're on Twitch, whatever format or whatever program, or whether you're at somebody's house, we're going to be praying and believing God for what He is able to do. Amen. Quickly, just a few announcements. But once again, I want to say thank you for those of you who take the time to join us and to share this time. And even as for those of you who are sharing the, the page, thank you because somebody needs to hear these words. Somebody ne needs to hear this powerful word of God. So share it. So we say thank you for that. Secondly, we all, I want to say congratulations on behalf of Good News Center. We want to say congratulations Joanna Christian who got five distinctions in her matric exam. Well done Joanna. God bless you. We know great things are in store for you and by the way for those of you who didn't know Jasmine also wrote. I don't know what the results are but I do know this that she passed with a university pass so she's able to move forward. Amen. So congratulations to them and I'm not sure who else. I can't think of anybody else who passed the matric exams. Congratulations if you did, and we pray God's best for you for the future. Now, we're, today is the 28th of February, and if you're looking for a 29th, it's not going to happen in a while. No 29th, no 30th, no 31st. This is February. We're already two months down. Now we're marching on. First to third, fasting and prayer. How much we need to be in the presence of God. So we're going to be praying. Join us. We're going to be, we live stream every day for, from Monday to Wednesday at 7 p.m. And I added something to this. Repentance, revival, renewal, and restoration. Repentance, revival, renewal, and restoration. And as I was thinking and praying about this, the Lord said, you know, if there's no repentance, there can't be any revival. So repentance, revival, renewal, restoration. And then fourthly, Pastor Cecil was emphasizing this, and uh, you know, I put this as my, some of the announcements. He emphasizes the, the Word of God and how important it is to know what God's Word says, that we know who God is. So we encourage you, and this is what we're encouraging, and some those of us who have been here, and those who have been involved in the media ministry and been able to come, we have put the challenge to read five chapters a day. And started in Genesis and I think they're in the book of Matthew right now not sure. or they're marked down now so they're in Mark chapter 9 so those of you who haven't started it doesn't matter start where you can start at Genesis when and where you know we get stuck on the first we're going to read who reads on the first like you think you say you will read don't read you're more busy you're more tired from New Year's Eve but start where you are. Make it your New Year's resolution today. Read five chapters a day. I guarantee you, you'll be able to read the entire Bible in one year and by, you may have a few days left over too. That's how many chapters are there. So if you read five, you'll, be in, you'll get a few days break in between. Amen. So join us again, even as we come together first to the 3rd of March and then we look forward until next Sunday we're anticipating God doing some amazing things. Amen. So don't forget, send us your prayer requests 
that number that you see on the screen. WhatsApp, you can send a WhatsApp message or you can send a text message or you can email us. As I said before, we will keep it private if you desire so. But we're going to be praying. We know God is able to do exceeding abundant. And we also know sometimes maybe it's difficult for you to cry out in faith. We're going to stand in the gap and pray the prayer of faith with you. We're going to pray right now. We have prayer requests, different people and different things to pray for. For those who have been watching, for those who have been maybe sending in the prayer request via text, we're going to believe God. So join me at this time. Thank you, Father. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you because we know what your word says about prayer. We know what your word says about asking. We know what your word says about seeking. What, and what the word says about knocking. Because we know that you are a God who answers our prayer. You are all powerful. So Lord Jesus, every request that we have, all of our prayer requests, we thank you, Father, for touching. For those who are in need of healing, we thank you for the healing power that is released. In Jesus' name, we bind every spirit of infirmity. And by faith, Lord, we speak this. And we say, Lord, the prayer of faith for healing all in the name of Jesus. We thank you that you meet with every need of your sons and daughters. Lord, even those who don't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray today that they will make a decision to encounter you, to experience you, to know you as God. And just like Peter confessed, you are the Son of God. You are God. I pray that they will be able to come to that place that they will know that you are God in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Cecil. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your hands upon him, for Patricia, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your hands on Tia, even for Debbie and Cameron who are in Cape Town. We pray and speak your blessing. Thank you for the word that was brought to us today to challenge us as the church that our message and our witness and the evidence that we present to the principalities and the powers uh, that we'll be making known the sovereignty and the authority of God. This we pray in Jesus' name and we give you all the glory and the honor. Amen and amen.